Network, which is the infrastructure that tracks a multitude of NASA's robotic spacecraft. NASA's Deep Space Atomic Clock Technology Demonstration Mission, led by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, has been maturing the latest atomic clock technologies into a smaller, less massive package suitable for installation on a variety of deep space probes to enhance navigation precision and gravity science across the solar system. Tonight, we're lucky to have two guests from the project to tell us all about it. Dr. Todd Ely is currently the principal investigator for the Deep Space Atomic Clock Project. A graduate of Purdue University and a former Air Force officer, he has over 29 years of experience in astrodynamics and space navigation. He has been at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory since 1999, developing and implementing navigation systems and architectures for many projects, big and small, including NASA's Mars Network, the former Constellation Program, and the Altair, Altair Lunar Lander. His research focuses on new navigation methods, adoptive na navigation, nonlinear dynamics, and mean element theory. Alan Farrington is currently the project manager for the Deep Space Atomic Clock Project. A graduate of Duke University and Caltech, he has degrees in electrical engineering and more than 25 years of experience in hardware and software development, with almost 20 years of that in space applications. Alan has managed a variety of instrument and flight developments for Earth science, planetary science, and spacecraft technology development. Other than spaceflight, Alan's interests tend, tend towards college hoops and ballroom dancing. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome tonight's guests, Dr. Todd Ely and Alan Farrington. Thanks, Mark. Thanks all for coming. Alan and I are pretty excited to talk about the Deep Space Atomic Clock Project today. Um, the Deep Space uh, Atomic Clock Project is developing an advanced prototype of a, a new type of atomic clock that we hope to demonstrate in low Earth orbit beginning in the near future. Um, now, the atomic clock, obviously, it can tell time very accurately. But that's not how we intend to really use it for um, navigation and science. It's a key component to those aspects. And so over the course of the next hour or so, we'd like to talk to you about how clocks and time play an integral role to the nav and science that we do in deep space. And to begin that, um, we have a little video to set the stage. Time. It seems to rule everything we do. Yet have you ever really thought about how important time is to us? You see, sitting amidst the hours and minutes of our day is our forgotten little friend, Sammy the Second. Often overlooked, Sammy's not only the heartbeat of time, but he plays a crucial part in another area of human progress, navigation. But what does time have to do with navigation, you ask? Well, got a second to find out? It all began long ago when sea explorers carried clocks on board their ships called chronometers. These clocks were set to the exact time as a clock back on land, and together with observing the sun, moon, and stars, they could determine their longitude and latitude. This process allowed maps to be drawn so other ships could know where they were going. Amazing! However, clocks back then weren't very accurate. And if a ship's chronometer drifted off by even a few Sammies from the main clock, it could mean the difference between finding their destination Hooray! and being hopelessly lost. Today, time is a precise part of a type of navigation called the Global Positioning System, or GPS. Yes, boats, planes, cars, and even our very own smartphones receive data back from orbiting satellites that calculate our longitude and latitude coordinates. This allows you to arrive at a destination within feet. Pizza. So you see, down here on Earth, it's only because of time, I mean, Sammy, that we can know where we are and where we're going. But what about in space? Not just space, but deep space. How do you navigate and explore a place where there are no longitude and latitude lines, no orbiting satellites to help. Right now, scientists navigate spacecraft by using giant antennas here on Earth. <laughs> no, not those kind. These kind. Just like the old sea explorers and our GPS, 
These antennas send out a signal that is bounced off the spacecraft straight back to the Earth. Scientists then measure the time it took for this round trip, and that's what determines the spacecraft's distance and speed. While bouncing signals off our spacecraft works, that isn't the most efficient way to navigate deep space. You see, the antenna can only talk to one spacecraft at a time, leaving others waiting for up to a day. And then by the time the signal's calculated and sent back, the spacecraft isn't in the same spot anymore and the results have to be adjusted. So, how can deep space exploration become even more efficient, exact and precise? How can a spacecraft's navigation as it travels further and further into space be more immediate and independent of having to check in with... What's that, Sammy? Of course! The Deep Space Atomic Clock. Scientists and engineers have now developed a way for the spacecraft to have its own onboard clock, so it no longer has to check in with Earth for its coordinates. This breakthrough device is smaller, self-sufficient, and can handle the harsh conditions of deep space. Now the spacecraft can make immediate course corrections on its own, and land with incredible precision. So you see, our little friend Sammy the Second is finally getting his due, paving the way for more precise and efficient space exploration, one tick, tock, tick at a time. So Alan and I are going to attempt to elaborate a little further on what Sammy had to talk about. And we can begin our journey talking about DSAC actually going back in time and talking about navigation. And one of the key components of navigation, obviously, is a map. And so to navigate on Earth, uh, maps have been drawn for a millennia. And here's an example of a map that was drawn in 1630 by Philip Eckbrecht. And what's notable about the map is that this is the first map to identify uh, 15 degrees of longitude with one hour of rotation of the Earth about its axis. And so um, how we use maps is not only to define, obviously, the points of interest that we would like to travel to, but we have a reference system. And in this case, our reference system are lines of latitude and lines of longitude. Seafarers have known for millennia how to find latitude. Um, in the northern hemisphere, we sight the North Star, Polaris, determine the elevation of that star above the horizon, and using that information, you can determine your latitude. Longitude has been a trickier problem. Um, there are a number of methods that were devised over, over the many thousands of years, um, the earliest of which was dead reckoning. Sailors would drop a rope with knots at the, at the bow of a ship, and they would see how long it took for, the, for those knots to arrive at the stern of the ship. And from that, you can compute velocity. And then with your time, you can compute your distance. It's not a very accurate method. At the time, there are other methods. Uh, the method, the astronomical method of lunar distances. And this was competing with using clocks uh, to determine longitude. Now, how we could use a clock to determine our longitude is at your point of departure, let's say it's Britain, you set your time to the ground clock there. You know your longitude because you've got your nifty map. And then you set off in your, on your, your travels. Each day at high noon, you check the time on that clock. You compute the difference between that clock's time and high noon. And now you have a measure of your, the longitude distance that you've traveled during your travels. And so that actually is the method that um, has established itself as the norm, at least back in the 17th or 18th century. And in fact, um, in 1714, the British Parliament was so desperate to figure out a solution to this problem, the longitude problem, uh, they set up a prize to 20,000 pounds to the person who could figure out how to solve this. Um, John Harrison toiled for decades building many clocks. Um, the challenge that he had was to take the accuracy of the ground clocks of the day, which were big, and try and develop something that was portable on a ship that could withstand the harsh environment that a, a ship presents to a clock stability. So what I mean by clock stability is, as a clock ticks every second, a clock is very stable if each second is the same length and time. If that length and time varies, you have an instability. And so on a ship, things like humidity changes or temperature swings or the motion of the ship can affect the stability of the, of the chronometer. 
Well, on Her John's fourth try, H4, he built this watch right here. It's about five in inches in diameter. And it was successful at achieving the objectives of the longitude prize. In 1762, a ship set, set on a, a, a course from Britain to the West Indies, and in that 62-day journey, it lost five seconds of time. The stability of that clock was one-tenth of a second per day, and that yielded about a two-kilometer error in longitude. That was good enough to navigate and actually set about the way in which mariners for the next couple of centuries would figure out their longitude. But civilization evolves and technology improves and our navigational needs and demands increase. So fast forward to the 1960s and um, the Navy needed a way to figure out where their ships and submarines are to a much greater accuracy than would be provided by chronometers. A system was built called Transit. It's about 10 orbiting satellites, low altitude, about 11, 1,100 kilometers. And it was designed so that as satellites would overfly the US, they would be tracked. Those tracking stations would compute the orbits of the spacecraft. And then that would be uploaded to the spacecraft. And then when that satellite would fly over a ship or a submarine, it would send a signal to that ship or submarine. And using uh, knowledge and the ship, using knowledge of where the spacecraft is at, because it would broadcast its location, it would measure the frequency shift of this signal transiting from the satellite to the ship. Now, you can use this information to figure out your location. But what it requires in this one-way signal is that the clock on board the satellite and the clock on board the ship are very accurate. And so chronometers weren't good enough. To respond to that, uh, the technology for clocks shifted to using something like a quartz crystal. And so here's a picture of the first uh, USO ultra-stable oscillator that flew on one of the transit satellites in 1960. And the way a quartz crystal oscillator uh, works is it uses the mechanical vibration of the quartz in an electromagnetic field to do its ticking. Um, this dramatically improved the accuracy of the navigation systems of the time. Transit could determine the location of a, a ship to about 200 meters. Uh, and we even used USOs in deep space. In fact, here's a picture of the USO that we intend to fly on our mission, the DSAC mission. Um, they're often used in deep space for a lot of uses, navigation sometimes, but they're still not good enough. On our, on our mission, we built a USO that is stable to better than a microsecond per day. It's good, but it's not good enough for deep space nav. And in fact, the transit system responded to the need of the time, but it wasn't good enough for global positioning. We're all familiar with this constellation, the global positioning system. It's a system of 32 satellites, and this responded to the challenges presented by transit by offering more coverage. 32 satellites um, yield over four satellites in view at most locations on the Earth all the time, and often more than four satellites. So this coverage allows us to get positioning to a much greater accuracy than 100 meters. And another fundamental aspect of this is there are now atomic clocks on board uh, the spacecraft, the satellites. And those atomic clocks are needed to ensure that the signals that are sent from each satellite are extremely precise and accurate. The fact that there are 32 satellites means that the user's clock doesn't need to be nearly as accurate. You don't need a USO. You don't need an atomic clock. Everybody who has a smartphone has a GPS receiver inside their phone, and they don't have an atomic clock. So how does this how do we determine our position more accurately, given that we have a, a worse performing clock in our phone or other ground GPS receivers? So I'm going to do a little thought experiment with you all to try and illustrate how this, this process works. It's a very simplified example, but the fundamentals are true for the more complicated situations in which we use navigation with GPS. So I'm going to go to flat land, a two-dimensional uh, space. And I have three GPS satellites indicated here in the corners. And I'm somewhere in here. And I'm trying to figure out where I'm at. And I'm going to take measurements with my GPS receiver that's in my phone. And the way in which this works is I'll get signals from 